Uh, hello, everybody. Um, yeah, my name is Tom Burdick. I work at Intel. Uh, this is my my talk on um, kernel timers, uh, jitter drift, and expectations. Um, some hard lessons were learned on my part uh, and and others to to sort of uh, build up this this knowledge and understanding or sort of uh, intuition about kernel timers. And I really wanted to to kind of share that uh, with with many of you and hope. In hopes that uh, you, you know, I might save some time or, or um, help help build some uh, some intuition about kernel timers for for those watching. Um, so let's see here. So I guess let's let's talk about what the idealistic uh, kernel timer might look like in Zephyr, right? Uh, we call you know, we create our timer with uh, either you know, a macro or K timer in it, and then we go in and we want to set up a, a timer to to occur with some sort of delay or period. Uh, maybe we give it a, you know, a delay of one millisecond and a period of one millisecond. And, and the expectation then is, you know, we get our, our function call back uh, at exactly one millisecond after we call starts. And thereafter, every millisecond that passes, we get a, a callback in our code runs. And uh, really the, in the ideal scenario, the, the only thing that would ever cause any sort of problems with, with uh, you know the that exact one millisecond period or delay would be uh, you know the hardware right the the our clock source is actually you know oftentimes a crystal or an RC oscillator those things have uh, you know small small variance in, in timing but uh, that would be the ideal scenario right um, exactly one millisecond every time no problems no delays no drift no jitter that's not reality um, we live in an imperfect world uh, so so what is a realistic uh, kernel timer look like? Well, uh, the delay is really uh, a minimum. Uh, so you can say, you know, hey, I want to call my function in a, in a millisecond and uh, <clears throat> getting some, some feedback there. I don't know if the mic's really hot, uh, but yeah. So, um, <clears throat> but yeah, the, uh, the, you know, the delay is really only given as a, a, a minimum. So you know, you say I want to call my function in a in a millisecond. Well, it's it's really uh, you know your function will be called uh, guaranteed after one millisecond, one millisecond or or further into the future, and that's true of period as well. And, and really, the the accuracy of uh, you know how how accurate can you can you set your delay or period is really the accuracy of one kernel tick. Uh, it's you know so we you know in the kernel timer API right you can arbitrarily pass in. Uh, a timeout value. You could say, oh, I want a timer in, in one microsecond. Um, and the reality is it's, you know, <laughs> it's going to be rounded up to the nearest tick. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the other thing about a realistic kernel timer is there's very likely uh, some jitter in, involved in, in, in your timer. So, you know, trying to rely on, on a kernel timer uh, for, for uh, you know, exact periodicity, periodic behavior you know, there's some things to look out for. It's not that you can't make it work uh, well in that in that scenario, but there are a lot of sort of gotchas, and uh, you, you know, there's some things to kind of keep in mind uh, when doing that. And uh, and last but not least, there, there's there's po there's there's actually a strong possibility that there's uh, some drift uh, depending on uh, your hardware. Um, so you know, if if you have you know some some agnostic code that you're trying to run across lots of different hardware. And you have, for example, a, a timer that's supposed to run every millisecond, and you're you're relying on the fact that, well, okay, like on you know board X, that's perfectly fine. Like it's it's about you know almost exactly one millisecond every time. And then you go to run it on a different board, and and it could be a little bit surprising that oh no, that's it's not it's not a millisecond. It's it's a little more than a millisecond, uh, and and that can cause some drift and and some issues. So again, something else to to keep in mind and and look out for. Um, so I guess, yeah, like, like what is, what is clock jitter? I mean, I, I think probably many of you already know, but some of you don't. And, uh, and what are the sources of jitter? So, so jitter is sort of a loss of precision. So, um, if, if I, you know, set my timer for one millisecond and it's sort of like, uh, you know, here, here's one millisecond. And the reality is it's like, it's kind of firing, like, you know, in this, this window of time after, and the, the wider that window is, the, the, the less precise my timer is. So that's clock jitter. If you if you kind of imagine like, oh, the timer was scheduled here, but happened here or here or here or here, over and over and over again, um, that's a loss of precision. What can cause that uh, for kernel timers? 
Well, there's many potential sources of jitter in, in, uh, in Zephyr with kernel timers. Uh, interrupt masking may introduce jitter, which includes if you go to use uh, like an IRQ lock or a spin lock, um, if you have higher priority interrupts than the, than the timer interrupt in, in your hardware, uh, that can also prevent uh, the, the timer interrupt from firing. And then there's some jitter, there's some delay in, in getting back to, you, to the, the timer system and getting your call back and all of that. Um, executing from, from flash uh, can also, you know, another source of jitter, right? You, hey, like I, my timer interrupt fires, I got to go fetch code from flash to then load into SRAM. Okay, well, that might take a minute. Uh, well, not a minute in reality, but you know, a little bit more time than than maybe expected. Uh, so, so a little bit more time from when the the timer actually fired to when your code runs. Um, multi bus masters, uh, you know, SOCs, right? Where maybe you go to try to touch some hardware, or some memory, um, right? There's some some bus arbitration that needs to happen. There's some delays, uh, variance in memory access time. You're, you're trying to you know touch, um, you know tightly coupled memory versus SD RAM off, off, in, uh, <laughs> off on the board somewhere that might, might take some time. And of course, you know, the hardware clock itself uh, can be a source of jitter, but probably not a realistic one. In, in most cases, most people are probably gonna be using crystals. Once you're using like a, you know, 555 or an RC oscillator or something, then all of that's are off, right? And so what, you know, what do I mean by uh, clock drift? Clock drift is really a loss of, of accuracy. Um, so, you know, if we kind of go, you know, I think a lot of people think about it. Uh, not right now, right now, sure. Um, sorry, my daughter came up to say hi. Um, yeah, so if, if we think about uh, what, what a, you know, precision and accuracy might look like, um, you know, we, we kind of think about the dartboard maybe and accuracy is, um, you know, like, the, the center of the, the bullseye would be uh, perfectly accurate and off to the right. We're hitting all our darts in the right spot, or we're hitting all our darts in a, in a nice little tight circle, but it's, it's not in the right spot, and that's drift. And, uh, and that can be caused pretty much, you know, the only thing that I know of that, that would cause drift in, in, uh, in Zephyr kernel timers is really the, uh, the, the rounding. So uh, the, the minimum, and, and also, yeah, like you, you, the minimum unit of time that you can really schedule things is one tick so if you if you uh you know if you try to schedule a, a, a timer for one microsecond um that's that's you know maybe that works on some hardware with with um you know like a, a megahertz clock or or more but then you go to run it on on some different hardware maybe the clock is oh i don't know 32.768 kilohertz like there's on a, a nordic board uh, for the most part or maybe it's on an xp board with the low power clock it's not gonna, you know, you're not gonna get a one microsecond scheduled uh, timer. It's gonna be all sorts of, um, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, off. So, um, yeah, so then, uh, right, the conversion from, from fix to uh, clock cycle can cause drift, and, and drift is the result of all that. Um, and uh, yeah, so what are the expectations of kernel timers then, uh, you know, given all of this, right? Uh, they should be schedulable every tick, and uh, this is really important. You should be able to schedule a timer every tick of of the uh, you know every every single tick in kernel ticks, and, um, and and why, right? Well, I mean, the you know a kernel tick is really a unit of processing time. So you, you can think of you know I want to do um, something every tick. That's that's that should be the expectation. Um, you should expect. Uh, you know, some drift if, if you're using time units rather than ticks. And especially if you're trying to look for, you know, code to work across multiple boards uh, with, with K timers, with, with time units, uh, the, the behavior may vary. Uh, and this is something, so it's not, it's not always hardware agnostic to simply say, I have a K timer with a one millisecond timeout. It, it, it may vary behavior over, over uh, different hardware. You should expect uh, some small amount of jitter, uh, regardless of, of what you're doing. Um, it's, it's, it's almost, it should be expected unless you're very careful. And, uh, and, and there is a, uh, a nice test that sort of like shows all this behavior and, and sort of gives some nice statistics that, uh, that I created uh, that I'm going to demo here at the end. And you can kind of see what your hardware does uh, with, with this. Uh, one, one moment, I apologize. Ah, yes, working from home has its uh, benefits. No. So anyway, um, <clears throat> Uh, now, let's do the, the demo here. Okay. Yeah, so what does this kind of look like here? 
So I need to do share. Um, okay, so I have uh, I have a Nordic board right next to me uh, that I'm that I'm running uh, live with the test. So you can kind of see the textual output of this timer jitter just uh, <laughs> timer jitter drift test. Um, yeah, so it's gonna, you know, it kind of like runs through, it collects samples, and then it does some statistical analysis. And, and we can see on this Nordic board, for example, uh, and, and you know, the, so we've set a timer for one millisecond. Uh, this is actually, you know, a, a not, <laughs> it's not an integer number of cycles that that, that ends up being because it's a, a clock of 32.768 kilohertz. Um, and then, the, you know, we ended up with like a minimum uh, a time a timer of uh, about 1.1 1 .1, uh, milliseconds, and uh, you know a maximum of 1.2. So there's some there was some jitter, um, and uh, and there's definitely some drift, right? If we if we set like a timer for one millisecond over time, uh, there will be drift, and in fact, like it's expected, you know, in this test case that we're going to see that drift, and uh, just kind of show that uh, we can also see this, you know, on the hardware as well. Um, you know, I, I, so I changed my test a little bit so that we can get uh, a GPIO pin toggling every time the timer fires. And uh, here we can see, you know, uh, on the front of the you can see, you know, hey, this is a live thing. It's a demo. But uh, yeah, I mean, we're collecting statistics, the same kind of statistics that, that are on um, from the test here. We need, we do need to do a little bit of math because this uh, the scope, I couldn't, I couldn't set it up to get the, um, you know, the period and frequency based on each both edges, but um, you know, again, if we divide this by two, uh, the, the time period here, it's about one point oh one milliseconds. Um, so again, we're going to see you know some some uh, some drift, and if we look at our standard deviation here, um, not quite sure we can divide by two, but I believe we can. Let's see here, uh, standard deviation. Yeah, not quite. But there is going to be some standard deviation, right? There's going to be some uh, variance, some jitter in our clock as well. Um, so yeah, I, I hope uh, I hope this talk was was really helpful and sort of uh, maybe you know building up some intuition about, uh, about kernel timers, how uh, what to kind of expect out of them, uh, how how they might work on different hardware. Uh, you know, they're going to work differently on on different hardware, and um, yeah. That's it. Any questions? Great. Um, just looking at the text output from your test, it um, the the non-rounded value is thirty two point seven six eight um, cycles per interrupt or whatever. Yeah. But the minimum was thirty six. Like that's a substantial difference. Um, it, it it is it is it's um yeah. So in th in this case, uh, for let me share that again. So this this is a you know this is a Nordic board, and if we look at so this is kind of tied into uh, the kernel tick rate. So if we look at the kernel tick rate here, the kernel tick rate is going to be um, you know it, it's actually higher than than the the clock rate. Right? The clock rate is. 32.768 kilohertz, but the kernel tick rate is actually 8,192 hertz. Um, and that's, and that's, I, I believe that's a, a, because on Nordic boards, the, the timer uh, can only be set like once every four, four uh, timer cycles. I could be wrong. I'm not a Nordic engineer, uh, but I recall seeing that in a PR. So th this is sort of tied into, right, exactly how, you know, this is all set up. And, and again, kind of going back to, to the point, right, where you can only set a timer as as, uh, as accurate as a tick, and in this case, you know, right, a tick is going to be one over eight thousand one hundred eighty two, but it's, it's going to round up for the next tick. Great. No, yeah, I mean that, but but yeah, exactly. Uh, I it's it, it kind of um, uh, yeah. So these things can be. Again, I, I think kind of, I mean, it's like, it, it's all sort of there in the back of your, our minds, I think, right? But the, um, but it can still catch us off guard. It, it catches me off guard sometimes. And especially when, when going from different hardware, uh, where, you know, again, like, I want to set a timer for one millisecond. That works great on my hardware. And then I go to run it on some other hardware. 
and oh, uh, it's it's not one millisecond. That's not, you know, that could that could cause some chaos. It can, it can things can go wrong. Another question as well. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry. I think oh, there we go. I just can't tell directions. Hold on. Okay, uh, my question is like a, uh, uh, there are actually like uh, two ways that you can have, so a, uh, like a, uh, for example, you can have your K-timers, other one is uh, you can have some much of the work queue item and then you can, uh, and you can uh, do some scheduling, right? So as you think, so uh, which uh, method would have the, the lowest uh, clock jitter? So can you repeat the, the other part. I, I I mean I heard about the the K time. Was it schedulable work? Is that is it was that the, uh, the other mean, thing uh, you were asking about? Uh, for example, like a uh, uh, in addition to using the uh, 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 K timer, you can have a uh, work queue item, and then you can have this thing uh, uh, like a uh, 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 you can do some scheduling after some delay. And then uh, inside the work queue item, I mean, uh, after this a uh, work queue item uh, get executed, you can actually do actually uh, 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 reschedule again, right? So then in this way, right. yeah. Yeah. So so uh, this is kind of like another interesting part about uh, curl timers. So I mean, I kind of I kind of directly talked about you know K term uh, K timer start and and having callbacks, and that happens directly in the. Uh, the interrupts, the the timer interrupts. Uh, so this is about as as and, and, and precise as you can get in terms of like uh, software, you know, driven timers in, in Zephyr without without using. Uh, a, there's another subsystem that lets you directly tie into like a different timer compare, um, and and that's cycle accurate. You can get like cycle accurate timers with that. But basically, every other uh, timer uh, in, in Zephyr is built on uh, K timeout, including K timers. So, for example, like your schedulable work queue item, that's built. That's built on. That's basically built on K timers, um, like semaphores with delays, right? Where you where you could say, "Oh, I'm going to wait for my semaphore for like a millisecond." That's built on a K timer uh, for for the uh, the you know the wait time. Um, so, so all of those things where all those kernel APIs where you can you can pass in you know time or you can also pass in tick values typically. And uh, the accuracy, precision, jitter, drift, all of those rules still apply. Um, and so again, that can that can kind of you know, um, if you if you need something more accurate, uh, right there 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 is like a hardware driver API that you can tie into and get cycle accurate um, timers. Yeah. Okay, we have another one. Yeah. If you want to have uh, a real uh, precision where you want to have especially uh, zero drift, would it be an option to accumulate the, the, the elapsed time and then compare to your ideal uh, uh, time value and then basically slightly tweak the, the next uh, delay? Is that supported? That's absolutely so. It's it's not directly supported by any kernel API, but you can do that. So you, like the so here, you know, on my screen, right, you see cycles and 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 all this stuff, and you you can actually get uh, there. There's you know, K cycle get uh, APIs where you can get the uh, cycle count of the timer and uh, and base your you know base your your next timeout on that. So rather than setting like a period, so exactly like what you're talking about, right? But there's no there's no automatic um periodicity like try you know like there's no api to do what you're talking about where it tries to you know if you if you go too far it kind of shifts it back uh there's no sort of like api to to deal with that in in the kernel i think it'd be a cool api um as sort of like a a build you know a library that you could build on top of kernel timers but the way it is now it's it's not done that way i think predominantly because that it, it adds more logic right there's more code that needs to happen to make it work that way um, but yeah, that would be a really cool addition uh, as, as sort of like a, you know, a little uh, layer on top of these. But no, it does not exist. But you can build it yourself in your application if you so choose. Okay, and we do have a virtual um, comment that someone wanted to add, which I think relates to what you were previously talking about. But they say, just wanted to add a comment that setting your scope to infinite persistence is also a nice way to eyeball jitter on clock. 
Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, uh, yeah, right. Exactly. So, so if you do that, you'll start seeing like the, you know, kind of the fu the fuzziness of, of where the, the edges are uh, sort of spreading out. It'll kind of look, look, look like, a, I mean, ideally it'll look like a little bit of a Gaussian, right? Like it'll be really bright in the middle and then fuzzy um, as, as the, sort of the, the window of, of jitter is there. Um, and, and you can see that definitely. Yeah. It's definitely a cool way of doing it. We're doing a last check for any other questions. I think we are, we are, we have gotten them all. And Tom, if someone wanted to reach out to you, are you on Discord? Are you in any kind of community they can get into? What um, are the best ways to reach you? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm on, I'm on Discord. Um, my, uh, my Discord name is Tom B, B. So yeah, feel free to reach out to me. Um, just ping me. Um, I'm pretty active in most of the Discord channels, so you should be able to find me. Wonderful. Thank you. And I'm going to do one yep. more final check. Okay. I think we are all set then. Tom, thank you so much for your time today and for um, joining us virtually and from wherever you are. And we understand that life happens. So thank you so much. And we'll, uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye.